Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's presentation on using enforced family time to support home learning. My name is Deborah Pugh, and I'm the Executive Director of ACT Autism Community Training. This is the second in a series of presentations that ACT is doing in order to support families and professionals as we try and make sure that we are taking what advantage we can of this enforced family time. Um, two weeks ago, we did a similar presentation uh, on anxiety and COVID-19 and uh, how to support families who have children on the autism spectrum and other developmental disabilities. And that's now available on our website at actcommunity.ca, uh, let me see now, backslash videos. Now, as the parent of a young man with autism who is pretty anxious at the moment, I can very much imagine doesn't take a lot of imagination on my part. The stress that families around the province and across the country and around the world are under at the moment. Um, we are always worried about educating our children and how they'll fall further behind. But I think also there's ways of looking at this situation um, that maybe give us some hope of using this opportunity. Um, so we have today uh, invited three excellent speakers uh, because what we're, trying to do at ACT is to focus on the practical. How can we make use uh, of this opportunity? Uh, because we don't have a lot of choice. We're gonna make use of this opportunity to see what we can do to support our children and to keep ourselves sane as parents. Now, ACT is fortunate as an organization because we have tremendous support from professionals around the province for our work. Um, and that includes our presenters today. But first, I want to acknowledge the financial support we've received from CIRCA, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Collaboration in Autism at the University of British Columbia. Uh, we are very much appreciated, appreciative of that. Um, and I also want to remind you before we start that we're constantly updating our resources on ACT's COVID-19 page of our website. And we will have more resources on education that we'll be, at, we'll be adding tomorrow morning. Now, I'm very pleased to um, welcome and introduce to you our three presenters today. Dr. Georgina Robinson is principal of POPART, the Provincial Outreach Program for Autism and Related Disorders. She is a school uh, psychologist by training. She is a certified teacher. She's also, also the parent of two adult sons, one of whom has autism. Um, so she has a lot of personal experience of the issues that face families, even in the best of times. Uh, Dr. Grace Iorochi also has experience as a school psychologist. She's also a registered psychologist and the professor of psychology at Simon Fraser University and heads SFU's uh, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Lab. She has three children in elementary school, which in and of itself is stressful just thinking about that. And our third presenter, is Dr. Anthony Bailey, who is the Chair of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia. Um, and I know that he has two adult daughters and, and survived that. Um, I, I should say survived them going through elementary school and high school. Um, now, Tony's going to be orchestrating our conversation today. So really it will be Tony leading the conversation with Georgina and with Grace and answering some of the questions that families have raised to us in the emails that you've been sending in. Um, and also things that have come to their attention as clinicians, as um, teachers, as professors, uh, as families have reached out to them. So, Tony, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Deborah. And lovely to have uh, Grace and Georgina here. Uh, Grace, perhaps I can start with you. Uh, Deborah pointed out that you have uh, three children. I can doubt for, vouch for their delightfulness. You're a very experienced uh, psychologist. So what's it been like for you uh, switching hats and trying to teach your three children at home? It's been very challenging, Tony, I have to say. Um, so I have twin girls who are 12 in grade seven. And then I have a son who's just turned 11 in grade five. 
And so for, for the girls, it's been um, not, too, not too bad. They've adapted to the Zoom sessions online and teacher assignments uh, that are due and things like that. They're a little bit more independent in their learning. Um, but my son, who just turned 11, um, is quite miffed that his home, which used to be his sanctuary from school, has suddenly turned into a kind of pseudo school, uh, but without all the academic structure and cues that he's normally used to. So, you know, he's been asking me questions like, um, well, why do we have to do this if we're at home? I mean, this is not school. Are my friends doing it? Um, are they really doing this work? Um, does it really count? Because the teacher didn't ask me to show it to her. And um, well, you know, do you have to tell the teacher that I actually did this homework? You know, think, so questions like that, which are valid questions, you know, do the kids actually feel like this is real school the way they're used to? So it's been challenging for me as the parent to try to uh, reinforce the learning at home and to say, yeah, actually, this is still important for you to continue to have the continuity of learning. So what I've tried to do is kind of frame it in my own terms. Um, you know, I've, I've said things like, uh, and I'm not embarrassed to say I've told a few white lies, um, where I've said, uh, well, everyone is in the same situation and we have to make the best of it. So we can be flexible in the kinds of ways that we're learning at home. We're not gonna do it exactly the same way that you do it at school. Um, maybe we can do things that are a little bit more fun, that um, things that the teacher wants you to do, um, we'll get those done, um, but then we can you know, put in some more fun activities that you wanna do during the day so that it feels uh, a little bit more interesting. So we, we try to use um, learning opportunities that happen at home um, uh, to uh, try to recreate some of the concepts that the teacher is trying to uh, incorporate in their um, schedule. So it's, it's, been, it's been quite challenging. I find that the most difficult thing is that, you know, uh, children tend to see the home more as a, a place where um, they associate with free time, they associate it with comfort, nurturance, and they don't necessarily see it as an academic learning place. Um, and so it makes it difficult because all the, the cues around in the environment are not school related cues. Um, so I think I, I've, I've shifted a little bit my expectations to okay, let me see if I can take this opportunity since we're all home to do more of the practical skills that we learn at home. You know, things like cooking, things like cleaning, planning, organizing, and even, you know, money, budgeting, things where we don't ordinarily talk to kids about, but could also be an, a learning opportunity. So I've tried to make the best of it. Thank you. Grace, uh, it, it's good to hear that you're finding it as challenging as everybody else. Uh, Georgina, Deborah, uh, let everybody know that you work for Popard, but I, I'm not sure that all the viewers necessarily know what Popard is. So could you just tell us a little bit about your organization and what you do? Yes, absolutely, Tony. So Popard is the, stands for the Provincial Outreach Program for Autism and Related Disorders. Uh, we are a Ministry of Education funded service, and our mandate is to provide support to all school districts as well as all independent schools within the province of British Columbia. Um, our services include student consultation, um, class-wide consultation, training for teachers and um, paraprofessionals, all educators. Um, and given what has been happening in the last month, with the worldwide crisis, we actually just starting on March break, decided to pivot. And it seems like that we're spending a lot of time pivoting along with everybody. But we looked at the resources and our services that we currently have 
and try to realign them with the current needs potentially of the province. So um, something that we did was we have contacted all of the school districts in British Columbia and independent schools. We created an online survey and we also then followed up with phone calls to look at what their needs are as they're trying to figure out how to provide uh, virtual learning to students uh, via families. Um, we also rolled out, we had scheduled at the very beginning of March break 13 courses to 390 participants who were teachers and education assistants. And over the weekend, we got that in an online platform because we couldn't teach it in person. And now we, with that experience, <laughs> stress experience, but nevertheless, um, we have now converted um, our other courses and many of our workshops to the same platform that we're offering to staff. Um, and we've offered a number of supports. I'll post some of that um, later with Deborah on the ACT website, but we've offered a number of supports to schools to help them, such as um, you know, virtual consultation on between the, we, we could work between the family and the home, but certainly through, uh, sorry, between the family and the school, but certainly through the school district. Um, and we also have our family school liaison support, which is in place to help families navigate the school system. I know that starting next week, our family school liaison um, staff member, Vina, is going to be providing a series of Zoom sessions to help families with um, the topic that we're talking about today, how to support student learning at home. So that's a little bit of a snapshot of what we provide. So I can tell that you've all been very busy during this lockdown. Mm -hmm. It sounds as though all of that information will be available on the ACT website fairly soon. Yeah. I know that in addition um, to all those things that are core missions of Popper, that you personally have been thinking a lot about how we can turn this adverse situation to some benefit uh, and taking some opportunity of the time that families have available with uh, their children with special needs. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, what you've been thinking? Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm approaching this both as a teacher as well as a parent. Um, I have absolutely been there with my children. I remember the joy of it all. Um, and, um, you know, also as a teacher, recognizing that you may go, you may approach your classroom with a certain lesson plan or the week with a lesson plan and then guaranteed things happen and you have to shift and adapt. So a couple of things. One is that for um, all of us to recognize, it's not just in British Columbia, it's not just in Canada, but the entire world is dealing with an unprecedented situation. And I, I think th that we absolutely have to recognize that and recognize how challenging it is for everybody involved. Um, often one way that people cope with stress is by trying to do more. So, you know, how can I be the perfect teacher to my children at home? What am I going to do? I'm not a math teacher. How am, how am I going to handle this? And so if there is a silver lining in this, maybe it is something that Grace alluded to earlier, embracing what can I use within my current contacts, within my current skill set as a parent to still teach my children, teens, or even if you have young adults at home, maybe even a partner of some sort, some functional life skills. And um, I can say more about that later, but essentially skills that will support lifelong independence and so often these are skills that we wish we had time to teach our children or teens, um, regardless of their level of cognitive ability. Um, I know with my son with ASD, he had very um, high academic abilities and I did not spend enough time teaching him things like, how do you, how do you cook? How do you do the laundry? How do you, um, you know, budget to go, in, uh, go grocery shopping? So I guess considering what is your context, what are you already doing without adding another level of stress to your day um, and looking at ways to work in teaching opportunities. And there are very many. Um, if I can give one example I thought of, um, how about making a pizza? And um, so you can teach a whole day's worth of curriculum just in the task of making a pizza. 
So starting with, first of all, what do my kids like to eat? Maybe I want to have roast beef and mashed potatoes, but I know they really prefer pizza. So start by offering them a choice. So there's some choice building. And then look through recipes together or look through pictures together, depending on their skill level. You can have them read the recipe. If handwriting is a task, maybe they're writing that down or they're organizing the steps. Then they're getting the ingredients um, and they're making choices. Should we have cheese? Should we have pepperoni? If there's two children and one likes each, there might be some social skills, some communication, some collaboration. Hmm. How could we figure this out? Mark wants pepperoni and Mary wants cheese. Is there a way to do that if we only have one pizza, pizza dough? So that's going on. Um, obviously, I'm going to need to do some things to structure it if they've never created a pizza before. It could be chaos. So creating a checklist for them, breaking it down in kind of a step-by-step, -step, thinking about who's going to do what. Um, and a lot of those things that I talked about um, in the teaching world, we could refer to as joint activity routines which are any task that you can do together at the same time. And it involves going back and forth, taking turns. Okay, the pizza has been made now. Um, they have to set the table, figure out where the cutlery goes. To this day, my son will put the knife and fork on the wrong side. So figure out where it actually goes and spend some time with that. Maybe they're learning to label or identify cutlery. Um, maybe they're making choices about which cutlery to use, which dishes should we use tonight? It can be fun. They cut up the pizza. Now you've got a fractions lesson. Um, you're serving the serving the pizza. There's more social skills. Mark, would you like pepperoni or cheese? Oh, I'd prefer cheese. Thank you very much. Would you like something to drink? Let me go and get you what you'd like to drink. There are just so many skills. And then afterwards, um, well, let's not skip the eating the pizza because throughout there's the built-in reinforcement. In any lesson, teachers will say, figure out a reinforcement. It's already built in if they like pizza. So don't try this with something they don't like. And then there's dinner conversation, which you could structure. A lot of times families don't have that time to have the conversation at home. People are rushing to activities or doing homework. So you can structure it, um, practice asking questions, answering questions, um, maybe having structure turn taking on what the topics are going to be. And then there's all the cleanup afterwards. By that time, you're ready for relaxation um, activity. And I don't know, I'm probably collapsing on the sofa, on the sofa then, but um, that's just an example of something you might already do that's really huge in terms of learning opportunities. I'm not sure I'm going to ever think about making pizza quite <laughs> the same again. Thank you, Georgina. We'll, we'll come back uh, to some of the points you raised, but, but I, I like the approach of seeing a learning opportunity in just about everything uh, we do. Grace, um, many parents in BC are finding out what it's like to teach children at home for the first time. But of course, there are a population of, of parents who for a variety of reasons have had to homeschool their children for, for many years uh, preceding uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. What sort of lessons can we learn from those parents who have hands-on experience of homeschooling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, Tony. Um, there is a really strong, uh, or more than one community of homeschoolers um, in uh, BC, but also across Canada. Um, and actually, I, I looked into this a little bit. There's a wonderful link uh, which uh, takes you to uh, Homeschool Canada and then uh, a bunch of links on that site for more specific like BC groups, um, community homeschoolers um, who have connected with each other. And, and you know they've had that incentive to, to connect with each other a long time ago because they've been homeschooling for a long time. So some uh, of us now who are homeschooling now um, are kind of just getting started, but I think we can learn from them. So we can take a look at what they've done, what they have on their websites. Um, we can also join some of these community groups and see what parents um, who have already done this, uh, done homeschooling, um, suggest you know, that we should be doing or some um, resource links that they already have established. But the other thing is we can also create our own groups. Um, you know, and this is something that 
again, not to add, as, as um, Georgina said, not to add to your stress, because I know all parents are, are pretty um, stressed right now. But if you know, if you have like an informal group or, or parents from your own school that you've, you know, you sort of know um, that maybe someone can take the lead on connecting um, people um, in your school community. Uh, and then kind of share with each other what you've found, right? Because, you know, everybody has a little bit of time, but not a lot of time to do maybe too much research on this. But if everybody adds the little bit that they've found, uh, and I'm also glad to send in links uh, that I found so that you could have them on the ACT website. Um, but there's lots of really good resources out there. I think the trick is not to try to do too much because you can be overwhelmed by the amount of information that is out there and the number of um, academic or school related links that are out there. Really, it's, it's, it's um, going back to what Georgina said is choosing very specific and um, a few activities that you want to use with the children during the day, so that you're not trying to replicate what what happens in school. I mean, it's just not ideal. You're not going to be able to replicate. Um, and, and there are amazing websites that have been developed since this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so one example is um, uh, the NASA uh, website. They have a NASA at home link where for our kids who are interested in space, now this is just one example, not all kids will be interested in space. Um, but there are activities like specific step-by-step -step activities that you can do with your child if they're interested in space. Um, there are experiments, there are arts and crafts, there are um, videos of space and you can discuss various um, aspects of that. So, so even just taking one link, uh, again, sort of like the pizza analogy, um, you take one topic and you can branch that branch off into so many different academic uh, or uh, um, you know just learning opportunities. Now, the one other thing I do want to say about this, though, um, is that um, children with learning disabilities. I know parents are really concerned. Um, they're always, by definition, um, behind academically in one or more areas. Things like reading, writing, math. Uh, and in some cases, they're behind in more than one uh, area, um, maybe in all those areas. And having long breaks from um, academic work can actually be a detriment to these kids. So we do want to continue. So we, we want to provide some continuity in their learning, for sure. Whereas other kids might just quickly catch up, you know, um, for kids with learning disabilities, too long a break. Um, from academic work um, completely uh, would be detrimental. So I would suggest that for these kids really do um, try to be more consistent in terms of their learning um, goals and, uh, and practice. So here you may, again, um, it's not all your responsibility. You may contact your school. Um, you know, they have an IEP, an individual education plan in place. And so contact the person who you normally speak to there, the special education teacher or the classroom teacher, or special education assistant. If they're getting private tutoring, again, connect with them, see what you can do with those folks uh, who are um, in, a, in a position to support you or should be supporting you to help you out uh, with providing that continuity of learning for kids with learning disabilities in particular. So it sounds as though, in fact, there's a lot of resources available, particularly uh, on the internet. But I'm also hearing that the absolute bottom line is to stop children going backwards. Uh, yes. we, we may not be able to teach them uh, new variants of calculus, but to retain uh, the skills they've already got would be a triumph. Georgina, can, can I come back to you? Because you gave this wonderful example of breaking down uh, a meal into a series of learning steps. But, but 
I can sense that you do that without even thinking about it. It comes naturally to you. So how would a typical parent go about identifying uh, some skills that need to be learned and think about breaking those down into identifiable steps and reinforcing them, sort of creating the type of program that you can do uh, really without having to think about it? Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, one thing that, um, and, and Grace, I'm just gonna piggyback off uh, Grace mentioning this is that parents should not be alone in taking this on um, at this time. The schools are um, the teachers and, and uh, specialists, et cetera, employed by the school districts or the independent school are still working. And I would say that is a, an excellent and should be perhaps the first um, the first place to reach out to, to get some support on um, what can my child be working on? Um, you know, if you're considering teaching functional skills, mentioning that and, and getting some of their support and input in doing it. Because for example, what I just did about the pizza is something that I may recommend to a family that would struggle with, how do I create that? And I could do it for another family as, as a, a person with expertise in this area. So that's, uh, that's one thing they can do. But um, in the interim, um, think about, first of all, what are you already doing? So, we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're dealing with so much. There's so much that's new. So rather than all of a sudden deciding you're going to start eating pizza, no one's ever eaten it before. Think about, you know, what are you already doing that's not going to stress everybody out? That's not going to be too difficult. Um, and then maybe what are some tasks that my child or adolescent, um, you know, could be learning to do that we haven't taken the time to teach them that I'm still as a parent having to do for them. And that's within their capability. And so identifying that maybe it's, um, you know, doing their own laundry. You know, what is your wish list for what you could do less for your child and that what they could do more for themselves? Think about what are other children, or adolescents, um, their age able to do and where might you like to get them to? Um, think about what their, their entry level is. So if your child has, or, or, you know, if they've never even looked at a dish before, cleared the table, you know, you might want to support that and teach it in a way that's going to be safe. Don't start too high. Start with as much as possible. And I would say this to teachers as well. Try to take a small step and aim for success because you want your child to be successful too. The first time they try to, say, load a dishwasher, um, having that skill broken down. And so that's something that's really key is uh, creating a task analysis of anything, say that pizza thing. Um, you know, you might wanna do it for yourself just to think about what are all the steps? What are all the things I need to figure out to do if I'm gonna teach him how to make a pizza? And you'll start to realize there's so many components. And then breaking that down for um, the child, scaffolding as much as needed. So, you know, parents are really good at doing this, I think naturally with toddlers and we see preschool teachers, anyone who's been a preschool teacher, you know, they're in their scaffolding, they might be slightly behind or to the side, they might be pointing, they might be modeling, they might be saying, here's the next step, do this. Um, and, you know, enlist family members. So if you have more than one child or you have a partner available or, a, or if someone else who lives with you, and maybe they like to just sit on the couch, enlist their support and say, look, we're all in this together. We're all going to figure out how to load this dishwasher. Often kids, I know I had two boys and um, depending on the situation, they would follow their brother's advice better than mine because you know what does mom know? So bringing them on board um, can actually make it a better learning experience as well and get them all in um, involved even in the same task. Then you're not creating multiple tasks as well. I like the idea of involving uh, the whole family because of course what's slightly unusual about this situation is we have probably got many families where there are two parents at home, which, which might be an unusual occurrence except at a, a weekend. And often there are things uh, that can be hard to teach unless you've got another pair of hands uh, to help you. The, um, the idea of breaking things down into tasks or subdividing things into 
uh, different elements might be something that would be quite novel to mm. some uh, families. Would it be possible for you to, to find a, a link that could go on the app website that could give people some basic idea of how we think about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, what There's a couple of things that these terms are called. One is creating a task analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, which is taking the task, analyzing what's involved, and then breaking it down into steps. Um, but we could actually absolutely provide um, some more information on that. And then along with creating the steps can be very helpful um, to create a checklist or a work list for the student. So they get that sense of accomplishment, like, oh, look, I've taken the dishes out. Now I've put them in the cupboard. Now I've you know, closed the cupboard doors. They get to check it off. But yes, I could provide some more information. To and, and just following up on your uh, that sort of sequence, what, what's your thinking about the use of rewards in this sort of situation? Because most of us respond better uh, when we're rewarded for doing something. How, how do you approach that? Yeah, so um, everything we're doing right now is new. And so even back to, let's say, loading the dishwasher, even if the individual, the child or adolescent is used to loading the dishwasher, they may say, well, I'm not doing it right now. I don't want to do it. This is time for me to play video games or whatever they want to do because they are in their own way dealing with the stress. Their routine is different. Um, as Grace had mentioned, you know, they're not normally at home. Uh, maybe having to do um, homework that the teacher sent home or go online or do some kind of learning. So I would say anything that you're trying to have um, your child do, whether it's a functional skill or whether it's working on something from the school um, to, to break that down, but maybe start with a schedule for the day, um, find small periods of time to put in the things that they least prefer to do, <laughs> surrounded by, uh, so interspersing it, with activities they do prefer to do, which in many ways is a reward of itself. Like once I finish loading this dishwasher, then I get to watch my favorite TV show, or then I get to play my video game or something. But um, you might need to use more frequent reinforcement. So you might need to use, um, you know, after every, you'll, you'll know based on your own child, um, it might be every couple of minutes, it might be every half hour, it might be three times a day. Um, but absolutely, the kids as well as the adults need reinforcement. So in addition to um, rewarding them, I would highly advise all the parents out there to be rewarding themselves. You can't just burn yourself out and be everything to everybody. So build in time for your own relaxation, your own cup of tea, your own, you know, time to sit in the garden without screaming children. Um, because you're not going to keep up that energy and that motivation if you don't get the same amount of reward as well. I, I think that last point is terribly important. Um, I, I've read numerous newspaper articles over the last few weeks pointing out uh, that many of us are feeling that we should be as productive whilst we're at home as we would be if we were in our normal workplace and in fact that's unrealistic given this sort of chronic background stress that everybody's under at the moment. Grace, we, we've focused so far very much on practical things, the, the sort of academic schoolwork or pizza making or loading the dishwasher, but of course one of the things that we're often having to overtly teach children and young people with ASD is social and communication skills. Uh, and I have a sense that lots of parents are wondering how on earth are they going to achieve that when government policy worldwide is to socially distance people, which reduces the opportunity for those interactions. Do, do you have any thoughts about uh, things that parents might do to facilitate some social and communication learning. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thankfully, this is something that parents already do. So most of social and communication learning, at least the foundational skills happen at home. Um, 
And so that's good news. But then also therapists often are working on social and communication skills in much the same way, that is uh, through play. So a lot of, um, you know, what kids do for play or just general, you know, day-to-day uh, life interactions is where social and communication learning happens. And depending on the age of the child, then you'd adjust, you know, what kind of play you're doing. Um, so for example, like with older teens, you're not gonna get down on the floor and, you know, play pretend. Um, although sometimes that might work. Um, but you, you might say to yourself, okay, what kinds of social and communication skills does my teen need right now? Um, and, and then, you know, think about um, what are some simple ways in, in, the, in the home that we can practice those skills. So one of the things I really um, like doing with my kids, because they always kind of resist when I ask them to write things, you know, let's, let's practice your writing or let's practice. Um, but they'll do it if they're writing a text or they'll do it if they're writing an email. Um, or sometimes, you know, I'll say, um, oh, uh, you know, you, you, you wanted more time on the computer. Well, can you write me some arguments why I should give you more time on the computer? You know, so, so getting them to um, either, depending on the child, whether they're more verbal or more, you know, uh, likely to write things, you can use that as a context for helping them to communicate better. Uh, you can edit together, you know, if they've written a, a text or an email. Um, you can do it just audio, you know, so, sort of sending a message to each other uh, on the phone or doing a video conference with someone. So th that's kind of for older kids. And I would say that the coaching can happen before or after or both. Um, and don't be afraid to use, sometimes kids really enjoy watching themselves on video uh, or listening to, to themselves on like an audio tape. Um, and then you can like go back to it. They can watch themselves, listen, and then you can sort of put in little sort of uh, coaching tips like, oh, I wonder uh, when you said this or when you did that, um, is there another way to do that? Uh, can we think, you know, how does this person feel about what you just said or, or, or how you said it. So there's ways of incorporating the learning in even a simple task like that, like sending a text or a videotaping yourself um, interacting with someone. Now there's a, um, the peers program, which is a curriculum that was specifically designed for teaching social skills to um, children and not just children, but also teens and adults with uh, ASD. And um, there's a book, but I, you know, you don't have to rush out and, and buy the book, um, but you could go to their website and I'll provide the link. Um, and they have examples of things that you can use. Uh, for example, ask for turns during play, um, being flexible and co cooperative when you play, um, being a good sport, uh, uh, sustaining play by commenting on uh, things. So they give you ideas of the kinds of uh, skills that you can use uh, when you play a game with your child, like simply playing a game. Again, not creating something new that takes you a lot of time, but something that you already know how to do and you've already been doing it with your child, but just turning it into a learning opportunity for them. I was really pleased that you mentioned the peers uh, program because one of the homework tasks that they have in that program is to arrange uh, for one of the group members to phone up another group uh, member to get people used to the idea of using phones or indeed uh, the internet. And I wonder if you had any thoughts, uh, given that we're using this sort of technology literally mm -hmm. at the moment uh, about whether parents could be encouraging uh, individuals who of course are isolated from their peers because of social distancing to use electronic means for, for having uh, additional communication outside of the home. 
Oh, absolutely. I think, um, well, we know, we, we know this is, this is the future. This is how we're going to communicate. Um, and, and probably it'll get more and more sophisticated as the years go on. So teaching your child is, you know, how to use technology and how to communicate through video conferencing or uh, FaceTime or w whatever the format is, is uh, not a waste of time, right? And it, it would be very helpful to them, not only to learn how to use the technology, but also to learn how to connect with people that way. Um, and how it, you know, it, it um, shouldn't feel awkward. I mean, right now, maybe it does, but just getting them used to um, practicing and doing that, um, even if it, you start with just like a family member and then slowly work up um, to, to a peer or a friend, right? Yeah, that's really good advice to start with someone who you're already very familiar with, a very nice way of introducing any new uh, experience or skill. Georgina, you, you mentioned, I think in passing earlier, a little bit about pushback. And that reminded me that uh, when my stepdaughter had her first, line, first online meeting with the school principal last week, when he said something to the effect that uh, the work wasn't going to be graded or wouldn't count, uh, there was a sort of cry going up metaphorically from his uh, child audience to the effect that if it didn't count, why should they do it anyhow? So I, I think we can expect either in small or, or major ways that parents are going to experience some pushback, either from kids or teenagers or adults, because on the one hand, the parent isn't usually in the role, perhaps, of uh, cracking the stick when it comes to uh, work that would normally be done at school, but also some sense that perhaps this is such an unusual time that the normal rules don't apply. So do you have any advice for, for parents uh, about how they can really make sure that some of these learning opportunities are, are not missed, but do happen when, when the individual isn't so keen on it? Yeah, I mean, that's a big problem, having um, kids with ASD and, and, and other special needs do work is a frequent, um, cooperate with teachers is a frequent um, referral that we receive in the best of times from schools. How do we get this student to do what we want them to do? So their cooperation can be challenging. And now look at this. Now we've got a new situation um, that's adding to the stress. We've got the adults, if there are adults, adult or adults in the house also stressed, they can't help it because of what's going on. They walk out and you know people are wearing face masks and they're lining up so many feet apart from each other and holding hula hoops and things, making sure you're far apart. This is all very weird, you know? So um, something that, that the kids can do when they're surrounded by strange and unusual circumstances is try to maintain some control. And a way to do that is by saying no. Even look at two-year-olds, they start it. Nope, not something I can say. And now I can have a tantrum and maybe I'll get my way. So, so if we, we, first of all, I think is the adults, we have to have empathy for what are these kids struggling with and try to see underneath the protest. Um, you know, why are they protesting? So could it be that they weren't prepared to do this? They didn't think they had to do it. Their expectation was I'm at home, I'm gonna watch video games today and sleep for 15 hours because that's what they usually do. So going back to having that conversation and including the children or adolescents in, um, here's a new routine. This is what we're gonna do, Get, getting their input, you know, who's gonna do what throughout the day because that's giving them a sense of ownership and control. Creating that daily schedule for the family, even if you don't typically do that. And I have a son flying home in two days who does not have ASD, but he's already telling me he's got a plan for what he's gonna do the minute he gets in the house as a way to deal with his anxiety. So creating a plan together can help bring down that anxiety, which could reduce um, some of this protest, um, building in choice throughout, as I mentioned, including them, because if they've said, oh, 
okay, so then it's going to be chore time, which of the chores are you going to do? And then it's going to be school time, which of these homework packages are you going to do first? They're more likely to buy in. Having that reinforcement that we spoke about. Um, and then also looking at what is the task. So if something's being sent home from school, and this is where, again, reach out to the school staff, to the classroom teacher, um, or if the classroom teacher sending it home, is there an itinerant resource teacher who could be of support? Is this task appropriate for them to do in the home environment? So think about if your child is on an adapted or modified program, they've been asked, go online and do something, sit and listen to you know, something, and then answer some questions. Is this going to be easy or difficult for them to do? Does it need to be modified or scaffolded in some way? And you, the parent doesn't need to have to be the one to figure that out, but I would encourage them to call or email their um, inclusion teacher and ask, how can, how can I have Mark do this assignment? This is unusual for him. It's different. I think it may need to be adapted in some way. Maybe rather than having to spend, you know, uh, two hours watching videos, he only has to watch 15 minutes and then write something down and then takes a break and then takes another 15 minutes. So there's lots of ways of breaking that down and making it more doable, whatever it is. If you've tried the pizza idea and it's falling apart, jump in and do more. So don't, you know, uh, lower the expectations if you have to. So start to back off a little bit if you're starting to see that things are escalating. And think about what your priority is. So day to day is your priority to make sure that they are getting all that calculus done and the house is spick and span? Or is it to make sure there aren't, you know, five meltdowns? We've had two today and, you know, that's bad enough. How can we avoid any more? I guess what I'm speaking to is the parents give continuing to give themselves a break and recognize that, um, you know, they're managing a lot. They're managing it to the best of their capacity in unprecedented uh, times. And, um, you know, building in also for the children as well. Have they had any exercise? Everybody's cooped up all the time. No one's melting down. Exercise, whether it's, um, depending on your circumstances, if it's running up and down the stairs, doing a scavenger hunt, or if you have a backyard, or if you can take them to the park and you've got dogs to walk or something, exercise will really help relaxation routines. If the kids already have some relaxation routines, perhaps that they do at school, build those into the schedule, things that they like. Um, that'll bring, you know, sort of the escalation level down and help them be more even. Um, and I guess just, you know, reaching out and trying to get it when you're seeing things aren't working continuing to ask for help because if schools don't know that you need help, they may assume that everything's fine. And so they're there, um, the staff are there and um, you know they've been figuring out how they're gonna roll out the, the education. But absolutely uh, from my staff are saying to me, I wanna be helpful, I don't know what, what I can do, you know, what, what can I do more of? And I think many teachers are probably feeling the same way. And so reaching out for additional support. Thank you, Georgina, very helpful. Grace, I wondered if we could stick with this theme of parents trying to sort out what are the top priorities. So um, when children are in a classroom environment, they can probably accomplish more than they can when they're at home being educated by a parent. So having faced this challenge yourself with three children, how have you gone about deciding what are the most important things? If you feel that uh, what the school are asking you to do is fine if you only had one child, but trying to do it for three is really just a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, certainly I would say um, that the most success I've had, in particular with my son, who's younger and also not all that studious, uh, is to uh, look at his interests. So really focus on your child's interests because that's where they will be most motivated to do any kind of learning. Um, so as Georgina was saying, 
incorporate their um, them into the plan. So let them direct the learning as much as possible. If you see that in the school schedule, you know, there's math, they've got to do math. So then, okay, what's the concept? Is it fractions? Is it depending on the age? Then you think about, okay, well, what does my son, what, what is their interest and how can math be incorporated into that? Is it possible? Like, is there a way, again, without racking your brain and trying to do all this research, but is there a simple way that you can incorporate um, the learning that needs to happen within what you know about your child's interests? Um, and just doing, again, I would stress doing only, you know, a few things a day, not trying to cover all the curriculum in, you know, that they typically do in a day at school. Um, and given the circumstances that your context of learning is home, I would really focus also on, on you know, using more practical um, skills to do that learning. Um, and then don't feel too badly about letting them play video games and things that you know they love to do. Um, if they're just playing idly, maybe the way they typically do, they're not getting as much learning from it. But if you turn it into a learning opportunity, for example, my, my son for the longest time loved playing Minecraft. So I remember actually fighting it, fighting it. But then one, one time I thought to myself, okay, why don't I just ask him about it? Like, what does he love so much about it? And what, you know, what is he actually doing in that game? I, I knew nothing about Minecraft. Um, and then he started telling me all about, and he had like vocabulary um, that he had learned from this game, which was really interesting, all about mining. And, 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 and then I said, well, do you know what that means? Do you know what this means? And of course he had the vocabulary, but maybe didn't have the understanding of what that particular mineral or whatever he was, you know, doing in the game meant and what it all, you know, was about. So we expanded on that and he was interested because it was Minecraft, right? So then we talked about those minerals and we talked about um, what you do with them and where they come from. And so you can incorporate like thinking of a video game, which seems like a waste of time can actually be a learning opportunity for kids. If you, if you do it in a way that A, you know, they see that you're interested in what they're interested in and they're motivated by that. And B, that you're not just letting it happen, you know, um, with him sitting in a room by himself, but you're actually turning it maybe even into a conversation or a social, um, you know, there's some social goals there um, with uh, Minecraft too, because kids can play together online or they can play with you as a parent. Um, and so you can even incorporate social um, goals in that particular video game context. So just, you know, just a few ideas for parents who are- And of course a byproduct might be that you become a Minecraft expert yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, we're nearing the end of our time, but one of the things that both of you have emphasized has been reaching out to other professionals uh, to ask for help when parents are unsure what to do or hit a roadblock. But of course, there are a large number of people uh, that an individual parent could uh, contact. Do, do we have any sense of what would be the right order of people or sequence of people that a, a parent should be contacting uh, rather than just picking up the phone and the first person who's in the uh, phone directory being contacted. This is for both of you. Um, I can start with something on that. Um, so there's what you would typically do and then there's the new pandemic situation. Yes. So I would say start with phoning the school um, there's likely going to be a administrative assistant or, or support staff answering phones. Um, you may not be able to reach the teacher directly because to my knowledge, most teachers are at home. 
at the moment, so they um, they may not be available to answer the phone in school. Um, they may um, be phoning parents or be able to receive a call. So I know certainly with my staff, if they phone the office, we redirect the call to the consultant who then will phone the family. So I'd say start by phoning the school, um, identify what grade um, your student is in. Um, and I would say then ask to speak with the classroom teacher um, or you may, if you have a child with um, special needs, you may first ask to speak with the case manager. That would be the person that's coordinating the IEP. And that would be a really good person who can help be the intermediary between what the classroom teacher might be preparing for, let's say everyone in grade five and uh, any specialized program for your child. Um, there are also other specialist staff that you may know the name of in your school district. The principals are primarily with also in the schools at this time, so you could ask to speak to the principal. Um, and then after that, there are various levels of district staff. If your child has special needs, um, speaking to either a principal or director of inclusion or student services or whatever term is being used in the district, learning resources perhaps. Mm -hmm. Helpful, Georgina. Uh, Grace, did you have any thoughts about resources outside of the school system? Oh, outside of the school mm. system. Um, well, there are some now, now with this uh, situation, with the COVID-19 situation, there are resources available on, uh, online. For example, if you're, you're, you, know, you, you yourself or your child are having uh, a great deal of stress or mental health um, is starting um, to be affected, there are resources that you can access online, like actual free step-by-step -step, like self-help around um, stress management. So things like that are available. Um, there's also, I know volunteer, like psych psychologists are volunteering their time to do like an online like self um, uh, referral, you know, uh, and free service. Um, so I, again, I can provide links for this for, for parents who, who want to be connected to these resources. Um, so more and more different professional bodies like counselors, psychologists, um, uh, and maybe the Learning Disabilities Association, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that as well, um, uh, try to provide access to um, either telephone or online help to parents. So those, those are, are ways that you can, um, or, or systems outside the school. But within the school, the other thing I wanted to mention from uh, the school district uh, my children go to, they've told us that uh, parents cannot speak directly to special education assistance. I don't know if that's the case for all school districts, but you know, if you can't speak to your child's uh, special education assistant directly, but you can go um, have access to that person through the director, of special education, okay, so, or, or some other uh, administrative uh, authority in the school. So don't give up, like don't, don't think because you can't get directly a hold of the person, uh, special education assistant, that you don't, that you can't get that help. You still um, can navigate either through the, the school itself or the school district to get access to the supports. Okay. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, I think you've given everybody a lot of really practical and helpful advice. And, and I think what I'm taking away from this is to keep it simple uh, and keep one's goals realistic, but to have some goals. Uh, we never achieve very much unless we're aiming for something. So Deborah, I'm going to hand it back to you to wrap this up. Well, it's been a very interesting um, hour. I just wanted to add that for a lot of families, um, they do have a relationship with a behavior consultant, a behavior analyst, a speech language pathologist, or an occupational therapist who they uh, have funded through their autism funding, um, or a counselor for, for, for children who are six and over. So that is something that 
they may also be able to help and advise. And right now, most of them can't actually um, visit the family home, um, but they can connect with the parent. And I think that's, that's considered a justified expense uh, under autism funding. So make use of those people. Often they have a wide range of um, knowledge about your child and can perhaps advise about how you can um, modify the information you're getting from the school or even how to ask the school for more help. You know, what should the parent ask the school for? Um, some of those people are also educators. So, um, and of course, some of the teachers are also, some of the school staff are also speech pathologists, OTs or behavior analysts. So there's a lot of overlap um, and, and we need to use people as much as we can. Um, I want to uh, also emphasize that this is an ongoing process for ACT. We're all sort of flying by the seat of our pants here. Um, and we'd like to hear from people who are listening today or watching today, um, what else you would like to um, be informed about. We are doing these about every two weeks, either every week or every two weeks, depending on who ACT can uh, round up and uh, request your input in. Um, if you have anything you want to tell us, you can email us at info at actcommunity.ca. Uh, you should also add yourself to our email list, which you can find on our website, www.actcommunity.ca. And our resources online are really, I am very proud of, both the resources we've developed around COVID-19, but acts website is a wealth of resources that everyone on this call and many others have contributed to. So if you have questions and you just want to know where to go on our website, you can send us an email and we can direct you, you know, if we can't find the answer, we can usually find someone who does. Um, but I want to close by, um, oh, sorry. First of all, I should just tell you that on April 30th, we're hoping to have a, a focus on children who are either awaiting diagnosis or just being diagnosed. And those are the parents who are trying to figure out exactly what to do at home um, when they have, you know, haven't set up a program or uh, are just concerned. It doesn't have to be a child with autism. So spread the word, April 30th, we're hoping to make it also at three o'clock and that will, um, you know, more information will be provided shortly, much easier if you are on our email list, because we'll let you know. And also we will post this, of course, on our Facebook page. Um, so I think I don't have anything left to do except to thank our three presenters, uh, Professor Anthony Bailey, Professor Grace Iarochi, and Dr. Georgina Robinson. We really very much appreciated all the families around the province, and of course, anyone else joining us around the world. Um, I'm sure we'll really appreciate the fact that you've given your time this afternoon. Good afternoon, goodbye, and thank you.